Good morning, everyone. This is Erica Spoth, uh, POTEST here speaking. Welcome to this third session of our webinar series. Just to recap uh, what we've done in the past two sessions, they were focused on LIDAR. And the first session focused on the fundamentals of LIDAR. And we saw a presentation where um, Amy uh, showed you how to use ISAT2 for vegetation studies. And then we had a demo on how to use ISAT2 data, how to access and use that data. The next session, session number two, was focused on the use of JEDI LIDAR data. So ISAT2 is a photon counting LIDAR. JEDI is a full waveform LIDAR. They're both in space. One is a satellite. The other one is on the International Space Station. So today and the on the last session, which is on Thursday, we will now switch gears and be focusing on SIF, solar-induced fluorescence, specifically solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence. And we have uh, three really great guests. We have uh, Christian Frankenberg, Philippe Kohler, and Karen Yuen. They're from the California Institute of Technology and Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So today, today's session is just focused on the fundamentals of solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence, and Christian Frankenberg will be talking about that. Thir Thursday's session will be a demo on how to use that data uh, with OCO2 and TROPOMI, which are two satellites in space that are collecting these type of measurements. So uh, welcome very much, Professor Frankenberg. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Remember, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Hello, and welcome to the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. Um, my name is Christian Frankenberg. I'm faculty member in Environmental Science and Engineering at Caltech, and partially also affiliated with the Jet Pro NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, both in Pasadena. And today I'm going to talk to you about the use of solar and use fluorescence to assess vegetation photosynthesis. So most of what we are going to talk about today is basically uh, what to, how, how can we interpret solar and use chlorophyll fluorescence measurements from space, they give rise to beautiful images like the one that you've shown here, that I've shown here in the background, but then also teach you a little bit um, the techniques, how we actually measure this from space. And then later on, Philip Köhler will talk a lot more about those details, plus give you some examples on how you can actually assess, access the data and work with it in a kind of real life settings. Let's set the agenda as, as follows. So what I'm gonna do here first, I'll give you a little bit of a primer into solar induced chlorophyll fluorescence, a bit of the theory and how we actually perform these kind of retrievals. Later on in the webinar series, you will have an overview of different satellite-derived fluorescence data products that you can take a look at. There will be some explanation about the specific characteristics, where they can be accessed, and there will be a demo with OCO2 data actually showing you how to open, interpret, and analyze the data to basically ask some specific uh, questions. And for all of these sessions, there will be a, um, recordings, there will be a Q&A session where you can basically ask us questions based on the recordings that you've seen. So what I'm going to do now is <clears throat> give you a little bit of an introduction into solar induced fluorescence. It's kind of the primer SIF 101. Um, what I want you to take home is also understand the real differences between active fluorometry, something that we typically call PAM fluorometry, and solar induced chlorophyll fluorescence because these are fundamentally different things and sometimes they are being conflated. Um, so it's important to really understand what the differences are and how these two techniques are used differently. Uh, then I'll go a little bit into uh, the topic as to how we measure fluorescence before I'll be talking briefly on one slide just on the limitations of using th SIF, uh, things that you should keep in mind. And I'll give you a little bit of a literature overview, what kind of papers you could read if you really want to delve a little bit deeper into the topic. So the learning objectives for today are as follows. First, I want you to understand the basic concepts of solar induced fluorescence. I want you to understand how fluorescence is related to photosynthesis and the electron transport within the photosynthetic processes that are happening in a leaf. Um, as I mentioned before, I want you to know what the difference is between PAM fluorescent 
fluorescence and solar induced fluorescence. I want you to know how to interpret the measurements and apply them and at the end eventually should be able to access open and analyze SIF data on the global scale or also for some regional local analysis. But let me start with some motivational slides. Why are we actually interested in solar induced fluorescence? What, what science questions can we actually answer with these kind of measurements? So at least to me specifically, it's about the global carbon cycle. Some people might have a little more local um, interest in the data set, but if I take a look at it from the global perspective, it is very important to basically understand how much photosynthesis the Earth as a planet is actually doing. So photosynthesis that we typically call gross CO2 uptake, sometimes it's abbreviated by GPP, it's basically the largest sink for carbon in the Earth atmosphere. And its future will determine whether plants will continue to do us a favor by taking up CO2. What do I mean by that sentence? What I mean by that is basically that every CO2 that we as mankind are being emitting into the atmosphere, not all of these will stay in the atmosphere. About half, only about half of the um, CO2 emissions that we emit into the atmosphere actually remain there. Of that half, roughly half of it is actually going into the ocean and the other half into the land at um, into the land surface <clears throat> and especially the terrestrial biosphere side which basically takes up um, a substantial fraction of this is often very variable in time i'm not sure whether you see my cursor here but all these wiggles here that you see in green these are basically interannual variations and in how much co2 the biosphere is actually taking up year by year and this is one of the biggest uncertainties moving forward into a changing climate. Will the biosphere basically still do us a favor by taking up more CO2? Um, or might this sink that we currently have um, actually be reduced in the future or even switch back into a source, source term? So that's kind of on a global scale of motivation why we are interested and really to really understand how the land sink functions, we need to understand the basically the engine of all biogeochemical cycles, which is mostly driven by photosynthesis. And then of course, we also need to understand respiratory processes, like how is um, reduced carbon basically being remineralized and emitted as CO2 into the atmosphere. This is the other big carbon flux. But here we wanna focus just on the engine of biogeochemical cycles. How do plants fix carbon from the atmosphere um, across the globe? So giving you a little bit of an introduction to solar induced chlorophyll fluorescence here, um, what you are seeing on the right is actually chlorophyll fluorescence on the bottom. So <laughs> on the top is a little display of basically dissolved chlorophyll. So it happens with all the chlorophyll molecules. This has been dissolved in alcohol. So in principle, you could grind a leaf, dissolve it in alcohol and get some kind of solution like this. If you illuminate this solution with a heavily blue light, so let's say light around the 400 nanometer spectral range, you should see some red glow. So this is weird. The color of the chlorophyll is green. You illuminate it with blue light and it appears reddish if you look at it from the side. So if you just look in a scattered direction and this can be seen with the human eye if you do it right. Um, so this is basically a re-emitted signal at longer wavelengths in the red wavelengths. It would be much brighter if you go a little bit more towards outside of the red area, but the human eye can't really see this. So there's a specific range around 700 nanometers that the human eye can still perceive. And this is what you would be seeing if you pr perform this experiment at home. So a small fraction of the absorbed light by chlorophyll is always being re-emitted as fluorescence. This is typically happening above 700 nanometers. The, the first peak is around 680, so it starts a little earlier, which might be the one that you see here, and it extends beyond this 850 nanometer range. And there's a little tiny overlap in wavelength range with a visible spectral range. So in principle, if it's dark, you have a blue light source and a strong chlorophyll solution or a laser with which you illuminate it, you might be able to see it. Um, so this happens even for dissolved chlorophyll solution, for instance, in alcohol, that's the figure on the right. So you might think now, what is this all about? This is kind of a pure chlorophyll solution. How can fluorescence now have anything to do with photosynthesis? Because these chlorophyll molecules in this 
Flask here basically for sure not performing on any photosynthesis in this case. And they're actually brighter than a leaf would be. So now we are going into understanding how these things actually happen and what they mean. So what is happening during photosynthesis or what happens if chlorophyll is basically absorbing light, which is just shown here on the right. We see a typical absorption spectrum, absorption spectrum in green, um, which shows where chlorophyll is preferentially absorbing. Typically there's a peak in the blue and a peak in the red. And uh, the fact that chlorophyll absorptions are somewhat weaker in the green spectral range actually give rise to the color of leaves. That's the main reason why leaves appear green because they absorb a little bit less light in the green spectral range than they do in the blue and the red. But if light is being absorbed by chlorophyll, what happens, you basically get an excited energy level in the system. And this can jump to an energy level here to a highest state. In this case, a red photon has less energy well excited to some lower state. And then there can is actually internal conversions that are kind of quenching the energy of a high energetic blue photon here pretty rapidly towards kind of a, the lowest common denominator, which has roughly the energy of a red photon. And from there, it can um, <clears throat> move down to some of the ground states after some internal energy conversion. And this signal, when it spontaneously basically moves down to a ground state without heat quenching, gives rise to the fluorescent signal. So this is what we see. We see excited states in a chlorophyll molecule that are internally being quenched to a lower energy level, and then they jump down to the lowest energy level and give rise to the fluorescent signal. So this is the definition of fluorescence, basically. So during photosynthesis, or in all chlorophyll molecules, a small fraction of light is always being re-emitted as fluorescence. This is what's happening there. And now we can actually use remote sensing instruments um, that overlap in the spectral region in the range where this fluorescence takes place to basically measure this signal from space, which to me still is very astounding. And in principle, I'll talk a little bit about this in more detail. This measurement is more directly tied to plant health and activity than traditional measurements such as just greenness, because now we're actually having a probe into the photosynthetic machinery um, of plants as opposed to just the status, like how green is a leaf, what color does a leaf have, which is really the only thing we have so far. If you look at this in a more energetic sense, if you think about a solar photon that's being absorbed in the antenna system within a leaf and in the photosynthetic machinery that is tied to some kind of reaction center that we are calling PS2, this is the center of actually the water splitting takes place where water is being split and O2 is being released. So photosynthesis is a byproduct that we are all happy about. This oxygen, um, this is happening in this PS2 photosystem. This is where photochemistry is taking place. And the amount of fluorescence that actually happens depends on the ratio of all these um, fates of a solar photon. So what happens with this energy is that it can actually either perform photochemistry, it can radiatively decay. This is a term in, uh, come in a more, than, more or less constant term here with a rate constant KD. And then plants have one peculiar thing that's very important. It's called NPQ, non-photochemical quenching. It's actually a kind of release valve of extra energy that plants can shunt energy into, and they can actively regulate this. So if there's too much light and the plants are stressed, they can't really use all this light for photosynthesis, they can activate NPQ, thereby have a higher rate Kn, and that dissipates energy. What is also left is this Kf term. Typically, this Kf is a rate constant for photosynthesis, and this is kind of an intrinsic property of the molecule. So Kf itself can't be regulated. Kd is often supposed to be relatively constant, but what changes all the time in a leaf is Kp, the rate constant for photochemistry, and Kn, the rate constant for non-photochemical quenching. And now, if we have all these rate constants competing for the fate of the solar photon, the yield of fluorescence, like what fraction is actually going into fluorescence, is the rate constant of fluorescence divided by the sum of all the other rate constants. Now you can imagine what would happen in this chlorophyll solution that I showed before. In the chlorophyll solution, it doesn't have the capacity to do photochemistry anymore. 
it also doesn't have the capacity to really do non-photochemical quenching anymore because that whole mechanism is not there anymore. In those cases, KN and KP would be basically reduced and the pure chlorophyll solution will thus actually do quite a bit more fluorescence than um, chlorophyll that is within an antenna system in a leaf, just because you remove these KN and KP terms here. So, <clears throat> moving forward. I want to go through a little bit of a Darwin review that Albert Pocock Castell wrote to explain to you how we actually link this chlorophyll fluorescence to photosynthesis for remote sensing applications. And I'll give you a little bit of an example here on the left slide again, on the left side again, of the chlorophyll AB absorbance spectrum, with the peak in the blue and the red, and the minimum a minimum in the uh, in the green spectral range. Overlapping with it, if, um, spectral description of the chlorophyll A fluorescence with a typical peak at around 680 nanometers, that is the first one, and the second peak around 740 nanometers, and then it slowly decays towards 900 nanometers. So how does this all go about and what factors are determining the amount of fluorescence that's taking place? So what I will do is I will walk you a little bit through this term on the right side here. And what we have displayed here on the right side is basically the fate of absorbed radiation and how this feeds into photosynthesis. So what I will do is first outline the first part here. Uh, something is here written called Fa par, which is the fraction of par light. So par is this whole light in this spectral range where chlorophyll is absorbing that is driving photosynthesis. That's typically the range between 400 and 700 nanometers. And Fa par is basically a number between zero and one. What fraction of the light that a canopy, a leaf absorbs is going into the antenna system. So the total light that's being absorbed is basically Fa par times par, typically what we call A par, um, which is absorbed par. So we have this incoming radiation, fraction of this will be reflected, as we can see here on the left side, fraction of the light within a canopy is being reflected back. A little bit is transmitted, so a little bit hits the ground here potentially, but actually quite a lot in a good healthy canopy is being absorbed. absorbed par. And this signal here actually gives rise to some of these beautiful reflectance spectra that we typically see in vegetation. And the structure of leaves actually gives rise to like a so-called red edge, where the reflectance of a leaf will actually go up dramatically beyond 700 nanometers. And if a human eye could see in this spectral range here at 800 nanometers, all leaves would be basically almost looking like snow, very bright. Whereas in the visible spectral range, they absorb a lot of light with a tiny little bump in the green range. But there are spectrometers that can actually measure this leaf um, brightness or canopy brightness here as well. And these are basically techniques that determine something like this normalized differential vegetation index that some of you might have worked with. Just basically just looking at band ratios in the reflectance in this spectral range around 800 nanometers and in this red spectral range around 680 nanometers. So this is the fate of a solar photon coming from the sun, how much is being absorbed, because this total amount of absorbed radiation is basically kind of an upper bound as to how much photosynthesis can a plant actually do. So what happens in the next step? Then it gets a little bit more tricky because now we have absorbed light and now we have to go into the photosynthetic machinery. What does the light actually do? Where, what does it power? A fraction here is again lost into non-photosynthetic non pigments, but the most important part, what the light in the leaves is doing is it's powering two cycles, both in photosystem two and photosystem one, where light goes into these and basically excites um, chlorophyll molecules. And these work in a sequence. It's often called the Z scheme of the light reactions of photosynthesis. In PS2, <coughs> We have this oxygen evolving complex. This is basically where water is being split, H plus is being generated, and O2 is being generated almost as a waste product. The hydrogen here basically <coughs> is not wasted in that sense because it can basically lead to gradients across this um, membrane here. 
and there's um, ATP synthase, which can actually make use of these gradients to use them to force H plus through here and thereby actually gain um, power this ATP synthase, which takes ADP and basically gives it back to ATP. So this is later on an energy currency to power the photosynthetic reactions in the carbon reactions. In PS2, it is another photosystem. It also requires light. Typically, they are in sequence and both should absorb about half of the total light. Um, so they should be coordinated. And what is happening in PS1 is basically a process that creates uh, NADPH from NADP. And this is gives the, the carbon reactions later the kind of reducing power that you need to power photosynthesis. You don't need to know all the details, but the most important part is that what's being done with the light is not fixing carbon. It is splitting water, creating NADPH, creating ATP. This is all. What's happening afterwards with the light, they don't know anymore. And in this time step here, we basically then also have um, these terms, like how much of the light will actually go into PS2 being used to basically split water here in this oxygen evolving, com um, evolving complex. How efficiently is it used in PS1? Even though there uh, it's mostly thought that this is basically not really variable, only the the yields in PS1 are variable and parts of it can be quenched as heat. So how efficiently it goes to drive the so-called electron transport chain, this is being determined here in the next step. This is basically similar to what I've shown you before. Basically there's the rate constants for fluorescence displayed here, but you can turn these equations around and compute the rate, uh, the, the yields for photochemistry and the yields for non-photochemical quenching. So this basically determines the fate of um, <clears throat> the fate in the electron transport chain, how much goes into fluorescence, how much is being quenched as heat, and how much goes into the real linear electron electronic electron transfer and the cyclic electron transfer. I'm not going into the details here. But typically this is being driven by both PS1 and PS2. And then a small part of it is being um, still leaked out through ele alternative electron swings. This is not so important, but the most important part is that the end product of this electron transfer transport chain in the photosynthetic machinery is ATP and, a and NADPH, and from the cyclic electron transfer, also ATP. So this is basically the entire part of the light reactions. This is the only thing where fluorescence is really taking place. Later on, the plants will actually use ATP and NADPH to fix carbon. That's completely independent in that sense from the light reactions, but of course they have to work in sequence because one process, the carbon reactions, actually use the products of the light reactions and they have to work in coordination and they have to work pretty quick. And this gives this is being done in the so-called Kelvin uh, Bassem Benson cycle. This is basically the way um, CO2 is being fixated where you have CO2 um, reacting basically through an enzyme Robisco with ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate and that basically fixes the carbon into a C6 compound first which is then being split into two, two C3 compounds and in this process which is enzymatic basically with the enzyme Robisco which is very important in global photosynthesis you might have heard about it CO2 is being fixed and then in several other steps um, these energy units that have been kind of gained in the light reactions, ATP as an energy unit and NADPH as reducing power basically fixes carbon, um, creates sugars along the line and actually regenerates this ribulose 5-bisphosphate at the end of the day. And then it goes in kind of this um, cycle part where the phase one is carbon fixation, then it will be reduced and then it will regenerate uh, the ribulose 5-bisphosphate so that this cycle can basically go on for a long time. So these are the basic steps of photosynthesis and it tells you a little bit how fluorescence might be related to them. There is some problem there sometimes. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> well, it's important because it is important to understand the differences in how fluorescence is relating to the photosynthesis of C3 and C4 plants. There's one alternative pathway um, for Rubisco. It can not only react with CO2, but also with O2. And through this so-called photorespiratory pathway, Rubisco actually works with ribulose bisphosphate uh, and O2. And in this process, it actually creates a CO2 molecule on the way out. So we lose O2, we gain CO2 in this case. So it's a sink um, term where actually uh, the electron transport rate then is um, part of that energy of these electrons in the ATR are being kind of siphoned off for photorespiratory processes that reduces the amount that is actually available for fixing carbon in the gross photosynthesis GPP. So this is one part where we might have a, quite a difference between C3 and C4 plants. In C3 plants, typically around 30% can be lost in this photorespiratory pathways, whereas it is mostly inhibited in the C4 photosynthetic pathway, which can basically create its own high CO2 concentrations near the Rubisco site, thereby suppressing the oxygen pathway. Yeah. Last but not least, um, quite often we are interested in net photosynthesis. So what is the net part of photosynthesis? What do we meet, uh, mean by net photosynthesis? We typically um, take off the autotrophic respiration. So it's basically relief respiration in this case. So if you have GBP getting in, if we take out the plant respiration, we are left with the net primary production. And then we can also look at heterotrophic respiration. I'm sorry, that can be reduced. This gives rise to kind of the net ecosystem exchange. And in the end, if you also take into account longer term effects, we can um, define the term NECOX, net ecosystem productivity. So, but for the case here, we mostly want to stop at the NPP term. So if you have GPP and then just want to uh, see what is the net gain win of plants in terms of CO2, basically just have to take into account autotrophic respiration pathways in the plants, which, which ends up uh, with the term NPP. As a rule of thumb, it's typically about half of the GPP that ends up at, as NPP. This is just as a rough ballpark number, but quite often it works out pretty well. If you think about the fate of a forest, um, this so-called NPP to GPP ratio is not always the same. Um, this is just one example. I always try to refer to references here in the bottom, which just shows like the annual carbon flux in terms of GPP and NPP uh, for a forest and with different age. So if it is pretty young in the beginning, when it's not a mature forest yet, it can't do so much photosynthesis overall. It doesn't, it's not yet fully developed as a forest, so GPP increases, NPP increases as well. Uh, the respiratory process like RA, or trophic respiration increases as well. And then the part that is gray shaded here is basically the part that remains as NPP. So in this nice optimum here, we basically have about half NPP is half of GPP, so this is kind of the peak productivity, so to say, of a forest. Once it ages, then GPP and uh, autotrophic respiration might actually asymptotically move towards each other, and the NPP itself is basically not increasing that much anymore, or it's being reduced. So it's kind of getting a whole forest into some kind of steady state, where its net effect on CO2 is getting smaller and smaller in terms of its sink. So, <clears throat> um, after all these complicating factors, what can fluorescence really teach us about for, uh, photosynthesis? So let's start with some active methods that have been used for decades. And after that, we can move on to solar induced fluorescence and what we can learn from that. And what the difference is, kind of two active methods. So, give me one second. <clears throat> active fluorometry, which we often call PAM fluorometry, pulse amplitude modulated fluorescence, is a method that has been used in decades of research because it's such a powerful yet simple method in a way. What it's doing, and I show you some example here of a leaf clip and the instrument, this PAM instrument here on the right side, and some graphic on the left to show the measurement principle, um, which comes from LICOR on the left and another 
um, producer on the right with the image of the actual uh, measurement devices. You have a little bit of a normal light source that can illuminate a leaf and kind of mimic PAR. But then you have a modulating light beam that constantly illuminates the leaf. It's kind of like an on-off switch. This can be running at 100 hertz or so. It's modulating a little bit. So it goes on, up and down, up and down. So you basically have one part which we call actinic light. This can go off. So this would be basically dark. If it's off, you can turn it on. This mimics the sun. What you can also do is you give it a flash. With a flash, we mean it's so bright that it's basically about four to five times brighter than the sun in during midday in California on a wonderful sunny day. So it's so bright that there's too much light for the plants to use because they've never been used to that. So it closes all the photo centers because it's too much light. And what this will do, I'll explain later. And then you can turn it back on to normal light, kind of sunny conditions, and you can turn it back into night mode. But what it's always being done is, during that part, you have this little light beam, which is very, very weak, which basically just gives you a modulated signal on top of the sun, so to say. Just going on and off and on and off. Um, and this is basically being run at a very high frequency. And the signal is also being measured at a very high frequency. So with this technique that's pulse amplitude modulated, so you can basically distinguish what fraction of the emitted or reflected signal has this modulation frequency and which one is more broadband. So it's kind of like an AC-DC separation. And in the end, what you would measure as a total light is something like this in panel C. So if it's dark, you only see the modulated light beam. If the light is on, you basically see everything is moving up a little bit, but you still see that little modulation on the top of it here. With the flash, the same, it jumps the actinic light basically jumps everything up to a high degree and you see the modulation on the top here. So this is infrarescence light. And in the emissions, you can then basically try to demodulate the signal so that you see what is the response to the actinic light, what is the response to just your modulated signal. And the important part now here is that the amplitude of your modulated signal is always the same. What you then would see in terms of the fluorescence signal which is basically, or oh, this was the emitted signal that's basically being used to drive it. What you will see in a fluorescent signal, which is this part here, is basically in the modulated signal, just a response to a fixed modulated light beam. So the amplitude of which is always the same. And you can see already here that this is disproportional. So it was very small when it was dark. It's a little brighter when there was the sun on. It's very big. Once you had give it this flash. The question is now why is this amplitude so much bigger? Because in principle it's driven by the same small signal, but suddenly it gives rise to much more fluorescence. And now we can call this a yield because the light that is driving this amplitude has a constant intensity. It's the modulating height basically. And this is the method that's typically being used in PAM fluorescence. So I really want you to understand how this works. That's why I'm going through some basics here. So outlining the power of active fluorometry and how we can actually probe photosynthesis with this. Again, to repeat a little bit what I said before, if we are interested in the fluorescence yield, the fluorescence yield here, we ignore the KD term now to make it easier. It's just the ratio of this KF, which is the fluorescence rate constant, which we assume to be constant here in an intrinsic property, divided by KF plus Kp, plus Kn. So this is the rate constant for photosynthesis and the rate constant for non-photochemical quenching. And on the right, we have some kind of curve of these fluorometry measurements for a leaf that has been in the dark. In the beginning here, where I outlined this as black, it's completely in the dark, it's adapted to dark light, and then suddenly you turn the light on, and this is the time period that is yellow. So you switch it on, keep it at the same level. So it's not slowly ramping up or going up and then down. It's just turned on, stays there like a block, and then it's being turned off at this time step and it's dark again. So this is basically what's being done here. And sometimes this curve, this leaf can be flashed with this so-called saturating pulse that I mentioned before. Now I want to walk you a little bit through what is happening at these different stages. <clears throat> 
So what happens in the beginning, if the leaf is so-called dark adapted, so it hasn't seen light or the sun for like, let's say half an hour or an hour, what a leaf does then, it relaxes all of these non-photochemical quenching mechanisms that give rise to this Kn term, the rate constant for non-photochemical quenching. So in this term here, if the leaf is in the dark, the Kn term is basically very, very low, but the Kp term is maximum. Why is this maximum? Because if there's no light that the photosystems can basically process, all of the reaction centers are open. That means they in principle can quench all the energy at that time. So you have a maximum Kp rate at the, in this dark adapted state, but you basically have completely removed the Kn term. And this gives rise to a so-called F0 signal. So this is basically the fluorescence yield under dark adaptation. So what happens now if you give it a flash? So if you give the leave a tiny little bit of too much light in the dark, the Kn term is still zero. So this is reduced to nothing. And the Kp term is also going to zero in that flash because you give it so much light that all the reaction centers are closed. So the processing through elect ele of electrons through the electron transport chain is basically being blocked. So Kp is being set to zero or near zero in this case, in most cases, because it's hard to really get it down to complete zero, which then gives a rise to kind of this maximum fluorescence yield. So typically we should add a Kd here so that this doesn't go to one. But this is basically the maximum fluorescence yield that we could get in this case. This is what we call Fm in this case. The M is always during these saturation pulses. And it, the main reason to do these saturation pulses is to set Kp to zero. Because only then can we really probe what the Kp is under normal conditions. And how this works, I'll explain now. <clears throat> so we turned off the saturation flash, it was still in the dark. Now we turn the normal light on. This is kind of remove the curtain from the leaf, let the sun in, turn the actinic light source on. So what happens now? So this is not a saturation flash anymore. This is something that the leaf might typically see outside. Suddenly we see the fluorescent signal going up. And then after the initial rise, it will actually slowly go down. And what is happening during that time curve is basically an adaptation of these Kp and Kn terms. So initially, um, when Kn, when the light goes up here, Kn is still very low and Kp has to first kind of get it at its gears. Um, it's not yet that high. So initially you actually give a, get a rise in the fluorescence yield because these terms might be reduced but then slowly the Kn term is kicking in. So the, the leaf is under light, the non-photochemical quenching mechanisms turn slowly on in time now. This gives rise to a decrease in the overall fluorescence yield. And then the important part is now here, if at the end of this curve we give the light another flash, what happens then? It does not go up to the same level as it did during the initial initiation in a dark adapted leaf. So what is happening here at FM prime here is basically we still kill Kp, but now Kn is still working. So the only difference between the term here in the beginning and this peak here, what gives rise to this difference in the absolute peak is that we suddenly have a Kn term in there. And this actually then enables us to compute what Kn is. So if we have all of these parts here, we can basically determine what is non-photochemical quenching. This is basically this part here of uh, the fluorescence curve is all normalized. We can determine what the PS2 photosynthetic yield is in the electron transfer chain, which is basically um, kind of this variable fluorescence part here, which is Fm prime minus Ft here in this case. So this part has to be within this uh, driven by Kp. We can also look at the maximum PS2 yield here. When we look at the dark adapted leaf, we can look at steady state fluorescence Ft here. This in principle should be normalized by the um, amplitude of the modulating light beam. 
typically this is all working in electronic units, so people are not interested in the actual units in PAM fluorometry, but just the ratios between each other. So that cancels out all unit aspects. So it's never really fully calibrated in terms of giving you absolute radiances, which is what we typically need for remote sensing purposes. And the only thing that we actually can measure from space, it's not strictly FT, it is um, in principle FT divided by the strength of the modulating beam times the actual A power value that is happening. So this would give rise to something what we would see from space. That's the only thing we can measure from space. Uh, we can't have a saturating light beam on a satellite that basically flashes every canopy and suppresses photosynthesis and thereby we can calculate all the yields. So we can't directly calculate APQ. We can't directly calculate the PS2 yield. The only thing we can measure from space is this FT signal times the absorbed light radiation, uh, absorbed light in the path spectral range. So the tricky part is now how can we relate measurements of this FT yield times power with stress conditions and potentially also with photosynthesis. Um, so what the power of active fluorometry is that we can basically directly compute this so-called PS2 yield and with that we can determine to a very good degree the rate of electron transfer that actually goes through PS2. So this is then basically J, this electron transport rate, is equal to the PS2 photosynthetic yield times the absorbed radiation that goes through the system times beta, which is kind of the fraction of light that is being absorbed by PS2. Typically people take 0.5 on average. Sometimes the antenna system can be redistributed um, in various uh, occurrences, but I'll not go into this. So to first order, you can assume that half of the light goes into PS1, half of the light goes into PS2. So how is this now related to photosynthesis? So in principle, we can consider the SIF signal that we measure, again shown on the left side, and the green curve would be kind of the spectrum that we see. It should be proportional to the amount of light that the leaf sees times the fraction of light that is being absorbed by chlora by the antenna system times the yield of fluorescence. So this is basically the photosynthetically active radiation times the fraction of part that's being absorbed times Fa power. This can be estimated from kind of vegetation indices roughly what this fraction should be. GPP, on the other hand, is also something very similar. It is, if you look at it in a more kind of light use efficiency description, GPP is also proportional to par times F par, which is A par, times a kind of photosynthesis yield. In our case, this is not strictly speaking the PS2 yield. There's some parts of this loss in photorespiratory processes should be involved into this factor. So it's not completely easy to determine it in the same way as the PS2 yields that I mentioned before. But think of it like a bulk efficiency parameter for um, photosynthesis right now. If you take these two equations, we can in principle bypass at least this par times f par term, and we would have an equation that looks like GPP equals fluorescence times the ratio of these two yields, times some escape probability, like how likely is it actually that SIF still escapes from a canopy and goes out into space so that we can measure it. But the tricky part is now um, that this ratio the yield of photosynthesis divided by the yield of fluorescence is of course not always constant. If it were constant, we would have the perfect proxy for photosynthesis. We already have a very good proxy for photosynthesis because most of photosynthetic variations are actually driven by par times f par. Now I want to delve a little bit deeper and look at what, how these ratios in the yields are actually changing as well. And this is just to give you one example here uh, where we plot the typical quantum yield of photochemistry on the bottom on the x-axis and the quantum yield of fluorescence on the y-axis. And what you typically have is that it always depends on the state of NPQ. If NPQ is low, both photosynthesis and fluorescence basically compete for the same kind of resources, so they are anti-correlated. This is typically happening here, so if the photosynthetic yields are high, NPQ is low, the two yields are anti-correlated. This would not be good. 
couldn't really be fluorescent signals shouldn't be anti-correlated with um, with photosynthesis in this case but once non-photochemical quenching kicks in and this typically happens when the sun is out so not not in the early morning or late afternoon um, situations but midday non-photochemical quenching typically kicks in and then these two yields are correlated with each other so this is important to know that this ratio of these two is basically correlated under high light conditions and anti-correlated under very low light conditions but under these typically high light conditions during middays they should be correlated with each other one thing this is important to note on the right hand side we have kind of averaged measurements that we basically took on avocado plants in my backyard with a PAM system um, showing exactly the same feature as this one here which was on conifers um, so in the beginning if you have low lights below this is all below 100 micromol per square meter per second at par you have this anti-correlation but once you get light on these leaves above 300 micromoles these are anti-correlated but one thing is to know that often the change the fractional change in fluorescence versus the fractional change in ps2 yield is somewhat dampened so if you have stress conditions the ps2 yield is being decreased the SIF yield also goes down, but not always to the same degree. It might be dampened by a factor two to three. But overall, this correlation that is happening here is a reason why fluorescence also probes to some degree vegetation stress and not just greenness and not just APAR. You just have to be cautious that in some conditions these yields might be anti-correlated. So we have to make sure that we are measuring in the right conditions. And we also have to see how these yields respond to different environmental conditions, be it water stress or other activities. And with that, I want to move on to how do we measure SIF. It's basically now from the theory of what SIF means to the means of measuring it. It's basically a broad overview of how we can actually measure this fluorescent signal. Um, this all follows after the theory that I've explained before. Now we actually look at it, how we measure this from space or with any remote sensing instrument, because we can't really afford these measurements that a PAM fluorometer is doing, which basically only measures this fluorescent signal by having this modulated light beam and separating the wavelength ranges completely. So the problem that we now have, how do we measure this faint glow remotely? Um, if you think about fluorescence from plants, when do they happen? They only happen if the sun is out. If the sun is out, the sun is also very bright in the 750 through 800 nanometer range. So you can imagine a problem that is similar to you having like a really low, low wattage light bulb and you turn it out, you turn it on in the middle of full sunlight in the middle of the day you will hardly see it it will hardly make a dent in let's say the brightness of the paper that you're reading or anything that is reflect being reflected on the ground because the background light is so extreme it's exactly the same problem with solar induced chlorophyll fluorescence if you look at reflected light from any surface from a canopy in the 750 nanometer range fluorescence just adds a tiny tiny little bit to it maybe one percent and how do we measure this 1%? Because most of the fluctuations, the sun, depending on the angles, variations in the total light reaching that specific spot varies much more than 1%. The surface albedo of a spot might be changing by way more than 1% from one overpass to the other. So how do we know what part of this light that we measure actually belongs to fluorescence? versus just some random fluctuations in the reflected radiance because maybe the sun was a little shaded or the reflectance actually changed. So this is basically our main problem. How do we measure something if the background signal is so large? In principle, this problem goes back to something that you might be familiar with um, if you look at minerals um, um, that basically glow as well. They also show often fluorescence typically in the visible spectral range and they absorb the light in the UV spectral range, how do we make those visible? Um, typically, you go into some of these museums, you go into a dark room, 
in this dark room you have minerals you're not swamped by outside light that you can see and then you turn on uv light uv light you can't see so it's still dark for you but the minerals absorb uv light and re-emit the light in the visible spectral range so you suddenly you can immediately see it because there's no background light but once you would open the curtain let the sunlight in you suddenly would not see anything anymore you would see the minerals as they would look in bright daylight and we have the same problem with fluorescence how do we measure the signal without having this curtain with which we can block off the background light to make the signal visible <clears throat> um, so this is our basic remote sensing problem in that sense and i'll show you one example of a simulated spectrum what we typically observe from space here in black so these are basically measurements that we would see as a total radiance at the top of atmosphere with a somewhat higher scattering depth of 0.46 this is a signal that we would see and the fluorescent signal that we would see on top of it is basically the red range the red signal here just at different units so you see the units here are about a factor 100 uh, difference so the signal here in fluorescence is 100 times less strong than the reflected radiance but it's basically emitting almost everywhere in the spectral range typically we have this decreasing slope in the spectral range and it's also being reabsorbed within the atmosphere by oxygen so this is a typical oxygen absorption feature but there are some peculiar features in here that i'll go into later because these features don't absorb the fluorescence um, that is being re-emitted from the surface because these absorption features don't come from the earth atmosphere they basically already happened in the sun and we call those lines solar fraunhofer lines so what i want to show you first is how we can actually make this signal visible in the laboratory because in the laboratory we can devise our curtain and this is one thing that we developed in one of these typical gas leaf exchange measurement systems how can we develop a curtain we can do it in a way by having a sun which we the model as an actinic light source so here would be a leaf in a kind of leaf chamber and we put a short pass filter in here so we block off all the, we only let light pass that is lower than 675 nanometers so now we have a curtain in spectral space it's like the curtain in the mineralogy museum you illuminate it with uv light that you can't see now we just illuminate it with light lower than 675 nanometers and then we have a four optics in there in there and only measure light that is being emitted beyond 675 nanometer so in this case it can't be coming from the light source so everything that we measure above 675 nanometers suddenly has to be fluorescent it has to be generated within that leaf because we didn't use that wavelength to illuminate the leaf so this is what's happening here this way we can make this absolute solar induced chlorophyll fluorescent signal directly measurable in a leaf chamber and this is one system that we basically redeveloped here the papers being mentioned here led by troy magni we can do this so we can do still the active pam fluorometry in this coupled system but we can also feed it back to a fiber that basically measures the spectrum directly and this is now looking at the absolute fluorescence coming out in this so-called ft signal in the bottom here and for fm if you give it a flash this is also something we can measure and this is being measured here in this term for these fm spectra that are reacting to the flashes so now we don't just see a one constant value but we can actually see the spectrum emanating from a leaf with this system <clears throat> just to give you some examples here um for fm and ft values so to say um, under different conditions so typically the fm values here if you d if you basically increase the ambient par light the fm values will go down because now fm is kind of more or less normalized because we always use the same saturation flash this is exactly what we are kind of expecting from a pam like system but now we can see it spectrally resolved and this down regulation in fm is basically affecting all the different wavelength ranges almost equally so it's actually hard to get any gain any information from the spectral shape here and for f lambda which is actually now reacting to the amount of actinic light this f lambda signal which is the absolute fluorescence basically what we would see from space is of course increasing with ambient light but under some stress conditions we basically see here 
in this experiment that the F signal here, the SIF signal, is also going down to M compared to the initial levels here if it is under somewhat stressed conditions. So there is some information in here on the stress level as well. But I would refer to the paper to go into more details if you're interested in. Basic message here is, in this case, we can develop our own curtain with a bandpass filter, but from space, we need a curtain. So how do we, can we develop a curtain with which we can actually make this signal visible from space or any remote sensing instrument? Because we can't put a bandpass filter or a short pass filter on the top of the atmosphere to make sure that the sun is not illuminating us with any light above 700 nanometers. So we need a dark room and we have a dark room, not a black room, but a gray room, not kind of physically, but in spectral space. So these Fraunhofer lines that I talked about are kind of our dark room. We have a dark room in spectral space. So Josef von Fraunhofer, he was actually the first to determine or to detect that if you measure the sunlight at sufficiently high spectral resolution, you actually see that it's not a continuous spectrum anymore. You have these dark lines in there that basically in specific wavelength ranges are much, much darker than in the continuum. And this is happening in the sun's atmosphere. So it's basically uh, elements in the sun that actually already give rise to these kind of absorption features in the light that reaches us, planet Earth. So if we had an idealized Fraunhofer line, Let's look at one like this in the bottom here, where we have in the continuum a nice smooth line, but inside this Fraunhofer line it would be completely black. So this would be our perfect curtain. And then we add some additive light source, what fluorescence actually is, which is the same everywhere across this wavelength range. In this simplified example, what we would see is basically a signal like this. It looks like the one previously. It's just shifted up a little bit. If we had a spectrometer that would just measure in this wavelength range in the middle, all we would see would be purely fluorescence because it can't have been come from, come from something else because it was in this line when the sun was not emitting any light. What happens though is also that the depth of this line is changing. So this high intensity or radiance inside that band divided by outside of that band in this continuum here changes. In this case, it changes pretty dramatically um, because it was basically go almost zero transmission within that line, which is not what we have, unfortunately, in the sun. But even if it would be having 50% transmission, it always changes this ratio of inside divided by outside, which is kind of a normalized depth of the so-called Fraunhofer line. So how would that look like with a real Fraunhofer line where transmissions can be between like 30% to 80%. So how can we make use of those as kind of a, our dark room? So I made up a Fraunhofer line here. It looks like a Gaussian shape. This is all flat to make it easy, but it absorbs light in the middle. So it looks like this. What happens if we have solar induced fluorescence? Let's assume there's no spectral dependency on that signal. All it would do is move the signal up a tiny little bit by 1% in the continuum. If you have fluctuations in light or reflectance, it would not shift it up by 1%, but it would roughly scale it with 1.01. And you would see a similar signal, but not exactly the same. Because once we take the ratio of this green and reddish line now, we would actually see something like the blue one. And you see that it's not straight, it's not a straight line it is a little bit higher in the middle. So this is why we call it sometimes the infilling of Fraunhofer lines. If you take this ratio spectrum, you see a tiny little bump. And what we are doing is actually we are trying to measure these tiny little changes in the depth of these Fraunhofer lines to determine how much fluorescence must have been in that signal to get the measurement that we actually observed. And this we can use doing fitting routines, basically. So we fit an entire spectrum over multiple Fraunhofer lines to basically determine this so-called infilling. So we fit this infilling and thereby we can determine the quantity of the fluorescence emission. So we basically use these dark lines as kind of our curtain. And for that, it actually doesn't really matter whether we are looking at a leaf, at a tree, at an ecosystem or a hemisphere. 
total emission that we measure, the strength of the light bulb should be unbiased. That's one key advantage of this fluorescence technique, that we are scale independent in a way. So if the satellite would look at a pixel that is half a city or just buildings and half a forest, it would really just measure half the signal compared to the same pixel that would be covered with the entire forest. The same kind of forest in both halves of the pixel. This would be different if you looked at something like an NDVI index where there's non-linear mixing effects in there and you need homogeneous pixels in there. This is a problem that we don't have. Snow, we wouldn't see. For instance, it would not be affected by that. The other big example is that this additive signal of fluorescence is also less sensitive to scattering effects in the atmosphere. If you've ever landed in a big city with an airplane at night, and sometimes you have like cloudy conditions and you have the street lights still going on and the airplane is above the clouds, you sometimes see the glow of the city light through the clouds. It just looks more diffuse. In principle, if we were to look at chlorophyll fluorescence, the same thing would happen. Under moderately thick clouds, we can still see this glowing fluorescent signal through moderately thick clouds. It's just that the spatial kind of sharpness of the signal would get lost. To be honest, we are measuring only at kilometer scale anyhow, so we don't really have a sharp picture to deal with in the first place. So this might be a moot point, at least for fluorescence research, because we are still working at relatively coarse spatial scales. So how do we measure this? It's basically exactly using this kind of infilling technique. And what we use is typically these wavelength ranges here, around 755 nanometers. These are just by chance, because especially in the beginning, because this was uh, wavelength range that some of the high resolution spectrometer that are supposed to measure CO2 in the atmosphere, like the OCO2 mission or the GOSAT mission from the Japanese, um, we're providing and we can use the infilling of these lines to basically measure the fluorescent signal from space. There's a reference here in the bottom as well if you're more interested in retrieval details. As a tiny overview into the history and evolution of these measurements, Philip will go into more details into those later. These were kind of the first measurements that we have obtained from the GOSAT satellite. It was actually two papers coming out at roughly the same time from Joanna Joyner one and from our group as well. We basically developed methods um, to measure fluorescence from space first on the GOSAT satellite, which is a Japanese satellite. And the first time we looked at the signal, we got an image like this. Um, now we laugh about it at that time. This was great <clears throat> because this was the best thing we could ever hope for. So this is the fluorescent signal on a global scale. Whatever happened midday when the satellite basically was measuring fluorescence over a long time period, this is an annual average. And we compared this to the best current model estimate of GPP at that time that came from this Fluxcom project from the Max Planck Institute of Biogeochemistry in Jena, we have this image. This is basically GPP in grams carbon per square meter per day. And if I flip back and forth, they are eerily similar. Actually, when we performed some analysis, we, in almost all the regions, we found a near linear correlation between the GPP signal that comes from optimized models and the global measurements that we could see from the GOSAT satellite. So this basically gave rise to some of these assumptions that SIF should be a good linear proxy for GBP. I mentioned some of the really strong caveats in the beginning, but in most cases, if you look at coarser spatial scales and temporal scales, this seems to be a very linear, a linear relationship between SIF and GBP. Um, what came after GOSAD um, came basically the OCO, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Um, this is just a brief overview here. It has much smaller ground pixels now, on the order of two kilometers. Much more, many more measurements, so the pictures are not as noisy anymore. But it does not provide full global coverage. So what it has is basically a swath that's only about 10 kilometers wide, and it basically paints this swath like 15, 16 times per day across the globe. And by having like this narrow brush, we can never paint the, the entire Earth with measurements. So it's kind of a striping measurement, so to say. But we have a dense measurement system along that track. So it can do specific things that we can't do with any of the other sensors. But the big caveat is that we are losing kind of the spatial context 
at the finer domain. But we can still use this pixel very nicely, uh, this me these measurements very nicely. And we can actually go and look into signals going over a city here, for instance, the city of Chicago in this case, and look at specific conditions where we can actually basically look at dependencies on the actual land cover type in more detail because now we have a relatively fine resolution. After this, uh, we worked with a Tropomi satellite, and this is now mostly work by Philip Köhler in our group here, where we can look at the fluorescence signal on the top left over the US now, the model GPP signal on the top right. We kind of have the temporal derivative of fluorescence in the bottom left and the temporal derivative of GPP in the bottom right. So this basically one shows the status for the SIF at that time and the other one, the temporal derivative, is basically just telling you how quickly it changes in time. And I'll just let that run for a little bit and you can take a look at it. So you see the spring broom basically appearing pretty soon in here. It starts in Florida. The derivatives are pretty high here in these areas. So the whole growing season moves over, corn belt glows up. And then you saw for a short time period these highly red signals here when you suddenly have a very dramatic reduction in fluorescence. And I will play it again. Maybe this time you can focus on the GPP model. This is basically modeling the seasonal cycle in the US and parts of Mexico. And you can see how similar in many, many ways these measurements are um, to kind of GPP um, estimates from, uh, from the best modeling perspective that we currently have. This is just one teaser what we can do with it right now. Oops. And what we can also do now, something that I won't really go into, we can measure fluorescence in the red spectrum range around 680 nanometers over the oceans as well now with this satellite. So this is an example here how you can see this evolution of far red fluorescence that we measure typically in the 750 nanometer range over land and fluorescence from phytoplankton in the ocean in the 680 nanometer range, both using exactly the same techniques that I mentioned before. So we look at the infilling of Fraunhofer lines, which is very different from other techniques that, that have been traditionally being used to determine ocean fluorescence as well. So what's pretty cool, sometimes you see these upwelling regions here, the west coast of Africa, or here in the Bay of Maine, near the Yemen, here basically phytoplankton blooms that are pretty extreme in this area, or some other upwelling regions here in the southern part here of Africa. But what we can do as well now is we can measure the signal from towers to get a more local perspective. It's just one fun example where we installed a spectrometer system that can perform measurements that are similar to those of a satellite at a so-called flux tower site that measures fluxes of CO2 and water directly. This was at the Nye Ridge site in Colorado, a very nice flux tower. This is actually Troy Magni here at the top, Katja Grossman there, installing the spectrometer system on the tower and a beautiful front range here, mountains of Colorado in the background. So we basically mount a spectrometer here at the top. And the most interesting part of an evergreen system is that it is evergreen. So this f pass signal, what the fraction of absorbed light is in time, is basically almost staying constant, be it winter or be it summer, because they maintain most of their chlorophyll throughout the year. What this means is we can actually probe a little bit better how fluorescence can figure out things that are related to yields changes versus absorbed light changes. And for this, this was the primary purpose that we actually installed a system at this site at Nyvold Ridge. Oh, this was not what I wanted to do. But having this picture here with the installation here, we could actually see that the GPP signal in black here, that's a temporal change here. This is the winter period and this is the end of the summer period and the fluorescent signal actually co-vary to a large degree, more than we thought. So during the winter time, <clears throat> when the sun is relatively still, still relatively bright at this site, uh, probably brighter than in Norway in the summertime, the SIF signal is reduced dramatically as well. So we actually track the seasonal cycle of the photosynthetic activity in this evergreen forest with the SIF signal reasonably well. And this is the first thing where we could clearly prove that it's not just absorbed light that fluorescence detects, 
it also has to do something with the quenching status, especially if it's sustained non-photochemical quenching, like it is often for overwintering evergreen plants, which is partially a different mechanism than the kind of more dynamic non-photochemical quenching that plants can turn on. So what to do if you want to learn a little bit more than this short brief overview, I just kind of put out um, two additional papers here. One, I would suggest Albert Castell's overview paper that I mentioned before. Um, this is a little bit of a book chapter just on the solar induced chlorophyll fluorescence, more on the origins, the relations to photosynthesis and retrieval, relatively um, broad overview of what's going on. Also talking a little bit more about the history of the retrievals itself. Um, there has been a very recent paper by Gina Mohamed uh, on kind of the remote sensing of SIF in vegetation, 50 years of progress. So this is a really broad overview of all the different topics in this domain. Also a very good overview to go through, a written by a lot of the FLEX people who work on a European mission to measure fluorescence by Lian Hong Gu, a nice paper um, in New Phytologist on sun-induced chlorofluorescence and it's important for biophysical modeling of photosynthesis based on light reactions. This goes really more into the equations of photosynthesis between the light reactions and basically the light use efficiencies and the carbon use efficiencies, photorespiratory terms, how you can actually pull everything together. So I can only suggest you to go into this paper as well. And last but not least, a nice commentary that Troy, Magni, Mallory Burns, and Xi Yang wrote on the co-variations of chlorophyll fluorescence and photosynthesis across scales. So if you want to get an idea of what's happening there, I would encourage you to read this paper as well. Last but not least, let's go through some limitations and caveats of using fluorescence, even though you might have heard enough caveats on the way here already. Let's see. So one is segregation in time and space. Um, so GPP and SIF show a surprisingly good linear correlation. So if we have it aggregated, this is a good point. Um, however, we should not conflate SIF to be always perfectly proportional to GPP, especially on short time scales. And the papers that I mentioned before will basically outline this a little better, especially on something like diurnal time scales, because typically peak GPP values kind of tend to flatten off with light, whereas the fluorescent signal will not really flatten off that much. Or if there's, uh, there's down regulation happening due to stress, the linear relationship can break down. Even though at larger spatial and temporal scales, we typically see a very good linear relationship. It might break down under stress conditions and shorter time scales. We still also have lots to learn about the relation of PS2 and fluorescence yield under different conditions. So in my mind, there's still some research that is needed under different environmental conditions, even at the leaf scale, even at the yield scale. The other part is fluorescence retrievals are not easy um, and the data is noisy. So some of you might not be used to that. If you've worked with indices like NDVI or EVI, they typically always look very sharp. So they don't really have a precision problem where the signal itself is noisy, but sometimes it can be inaccurate. So it looks sharp, but it's wrong. Um, what we have with fluorescence, it's often accurate, but noisy. It's like a grainy old digital camera that's always has a bad detector chip and it always looks a little, a little grainy and noisy. And this is one thing that hampers our retrieval. It's just there by nature because we have to measure this little infilling, which is tiny. So we need a good spectrometer where we need a super high signal to noise ratio in the spectrometer to actually see that signal at all. So the retrieved fluorescence is by nature noisy. We typically provide and give you estimates of how high the noise is, like what's the uncertainty in each measurement, we provide this with the data. So look at it and see whether any changes that you see are actually higher than the noise. So the noise should be handled properly. It also means beware of the meaning of R square. If you plot fluorescence against any other property, if you have a noisy signal on one axis, the R square will look bad, even if the mechanisms would be perfectly linear or perfectly correlated. Just by having noisy measurements, the R square will go down. <clears throat> 
once you take the noise into account, fits might be perfect. At the larger, coarser, spatial and temporal scales, I think we still need to fully understand why it works so well. So there might be adaptive processes that plants actually find their sweet spot in time um, in specific PS2 yield conditions where they like to be because it's comfortable, so to say, where they work in their optimal way. And under these conditions, you might actually see this nice linear correlation. But how and why this works so well, we still have to understand this a little better. And also remember that SIF is mostly a proxy for electron transport rate, as both of these are driven by absorbed light. How this is being used to fix carbon in the carbon reactions is a completely different story. It basically gives rise to changes between how SIF is related to GPP between like the C3 and C4 photosynthetic pathways. They have a slightly different SIF to GPP relationship. So these things should be taken into account in general. So next steps, future uses of SIF. More research is needed on SIF GPP relationships from how do we scale it from the leaf to the canopy. Um, sustained non-photochemical quenching and SIF needs to be properly understood and characterized. There are avenues already in place, but there's probably more research that could be needed, especially in this transitioning period when non-sustained quenching kicks in or is being relaxed. Ideally, in the future, we want to combine the measurements of SIF with other metrics to basically break the caveats that I mentioned before. This could be done through, let's say, measuring transpiration, which gives you some proxy for stomatal conductance and thereby also GPP. You could measure the photochemical reflectance index, which is more tuning onto this NPQ mechanism. If you get some of the other variables a handle on kind of the stress level, you might be able to use SIF much better determine GPP. We could work towards measuring diurnal cycles from space. Right now we can't really do that. OCO3 might provide a little glimpse into that, but it's not really measuring the same place at different times of day. So what can we learn from SIF at shorter time scales? That's also one reason why we look into tower data. Make use of SIF signals at different spectral positions. We found that in terms of the intrinsic SIF being emitted from chloroplasts, this is probably relatively hard to do, but it might tell us something about the chlorophyll reabsorption within the canopy. So it, it probably bears a lot of um, signal strength in terms of the, the structural effects that determine SIF in different wavelength ranges. I'll also take a look at FLEX, which is basically will be the first dedicated fluorescence mission um, by ESA. And I put down the link here. And they basically triggered a lot of the fluorescence research with their proposed instrument. And be innovative. Do something that I haven't mentioned here. Be innovative, use your own methods, use it intelligently. There's so much data in so many different areas that local studies could be used and apply that. Um, so the sky is the limit. And with that, I wanna finish my slides here and wish you all the best for the remaining work packages. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Frankenberg, for that thorough uh, review on SIF. And now, before we start the Q&A, I wanted to introduce two other um, guest lecturers that we have here with us. Uh, they will be talking about SIF on Thursday, but I'd like to introduce them to the group today. So we have uh, Dr. Philip Kohler from Caltech. Philip, are you there? Can you can you please uh, introduce yourself? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Ah, perfect. So my name is Philip Kohler and uh, I work in Christian Frankenberg's group and I'm mainly responsible for running all the solar and used chlorophyll fluorescence retrievals. So my latest products are from Tropomi in the red and far red spectral range. Great, thank you very much. And we have uh, Karen Ewan from the Jet Proportion Laboratory. Karen, would you please introduce yourself? 
Hi, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Um, I look forward to speaking with you all on Thursday, and thank you so much for joining us. And I want to thank you all on behalf of um, the OCO2 and the OCO3 projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we have been gathering the questions that you've been writing on the chat box, and we have been compiling them into a document that you should see on your screen now. And what we'll do is we'll be working down these questions and, um, and answering each of them. If by any chance we cannot get through all of them, we will be posting this document online in the next uh, couple of days. All right, so let's start with the first question. Question number one, is there a direct way to measure net productivity from SIF or does it work more like NDVI? Go ahead, Christian. Oh, my apologies. Um, so I can just outline my response here again. Um, so in principle, fluorescence only represents processes that are happening in the light reactions of photosynthesis. So it doesn't capture anything that has to do with respiratory processes, be it in the leaf or from the ecosystem itself. So neither autotrophic nor heterotrophic respiration. In principle, the only thing you could do to alleviate that problem is use CO2 flux measurements at the same time so that you can disentangle net fluxes from gross fluxes. But this is kind of the only thing you could do. Um, however, I should stress that fluorescence is more than just NDVI as it captures basically the true green APA. That means you absorb light only by chlorophyll molecules, nothing else. So the branches or other things are not being included. Um, plus, we can also capture some of the yield effects, as I mentioned in the presentation before. Great, thank you. Uh, question number two, can you estimate SIF using hyperspectral data? Uh, that's an excellent question. In principle, yes. It depends really on the spectral resolution and the observing geometry. Um, so if your detector is right above the canopy, um, you might be able to work just by looking at the infilling of uh, oxygen lines, dioxygen lines, um, which are broader in that sense that you can probably get away with a spectrometer with about one to two nanometer spectral resolution. So if this is what you have, you might be able to pull this off from directly above the canopy. Doing this from space will be much, much, much harder because then you will also have to take into account O2 reabsorptions and a lot of the scattering effects. So it really depends on it geometry but in principle you don't need the same kind of high super high resolution and high signal to noise instruments that we have in space if you are right above the canopy okay. question number three what is the earliest data in terms of years that i can get that that's a good question uh, ironically it goes back further than when we started detecting it <laughs> so there's Good website that, that we posted here that you can follow at uh, climatesciences.jpl.nasa.gov slash SIF, um, which is a measures project from NASA to actually make all the data available that we have for fluorescence at the moment. Um, and the earliest data that we basically have right now starts around 1995 from the GOMI satellite. But bear in mind that this is at much coarser spatial and spectral resolution than the, the images that we showed you at the end. So once we go to like the year 2018, we start having tropomi data, which for us is kind of um, the best instrument that we currently have for fluorescence research. Um, but there's also the OCO2 mission, things like that, that start kind of earlier than, than tropomi, of course, a couple of years. Okay. Question four, what are the differences between PS1 and PS2? That's a tricky question. <laughs> it would take a long time to go into this in detail, and I'm probably also not the expert on this. Um, but basically, PS2 is the first part of the Z scheme, uh, the electron transport chain, and this is also where the water splitting and O2 generation basically happens. And the electrons that are then being transferred in the electron transport ch chain through PS1 as well are used to produce the high energy carrier and ADPH. And together, if you combine generation of ATP and ADPH. These are the ones that are being produced by both together and that are then powering the carbon reactions. But I could post some uh, links to papers that, that might go into more detail if that is warranted. Good, that would probably be very useful. 
Okay, so question ah, maybe five. it's also worth to mention in this context that actually, so the naming might be a bit confusing that PS2 uh, uh, leads to PS1 or gives the electron or the electron chain goes from PS2 to PS1. But the only reason is that uh, PS1 was discovered earlier. Great, great. That's a great point, yes. Okay, question five. I have some experience with ArcGIS Pro, but I still would consider myself a beginner. Can you please recommend a particular easy reading for someone who is still taking first steps in this field of how to use SIF data? So this will be covered on Thursday where um, uh, Philip is going to be doing a demo, but uh, maybe you can say a little bit about that now, Philip? Um, in principle, all the data comes in uh, net CDF format, so there's no way around programming a bit, at least right now. So if you are familiar with any of those climate-related files or satellite data in general, it's always shared in this format, and there are, you you can read those files with the multitude of programs for example there's one um, where you could just take a look at the data with panoply uh, i think it's provided by nasa right um, yeah we posted a yeah. link link to the download as well you can also use just a regular python program or r or julia so you're really free to use whatever programming language is able to read net cdf files so and there's a difference between those single soundings and gridded data i will touch on this on um, thursday but just to let you know if you want to look at a world map you would need to use level three data so in general what you have for satellite data is level one is the raw spectra um, level two are uh, is already a product so when i estimate the amount of chlorophyll fluorescence that would be considered as level two um, but it's still on a single sounding basis and once you start to aggregate those data spatially this is called level three data and we have also a few files available and tools how to grid those data sets and um, yeah that that would be then the ideal case for panoply where you can just take a look how those time steps look on a world map. Okay. Question six. Could you explain the K terms again? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, so in principle, the K terms that we refer to are basically rate constants. Um, think of it like reaction rates and chemical reactions. It's kind of basically the, the, the reaction constant. For fluorescence, the Kf term is usually a constant, so we assume that this is an intrinsic property of the chlorophyll molecule. It's a temperature dependence in there, but in principle, this is something that plants can't regulate. Kf is not uh, can't be regulated. However, the fluorescence yield can be regulated by just changing things like the rate constant for photosynthesis, which basically depends on how many photosystems are open at that time, and the so-called non-photochemical quenching decay (NPQ), which is kind of like sometimes call it the pressure release valve. <laughs> so if there's too, much, too many electrons flowing into the system, you not, kind of need to dispose them by some way or fashion. And it's typically being actively done through the KM term. You can think of some kind of bathtub analogy where all the electrons are kind of the water flowing into your bathtub, but now you have like three or four little exit holes and they could all be called, that one of them is KF, it's a constant pipe diameter. The other ones is KP and KN that you can actually open and close. And depending on how much you open and close the other ones, it will basically determine a little bit how much is flowing through all the other outlets, if that makes sense. Great. Question seven, which caveats do you mean to use the NDVI to calculate GPP? So there's a few things. One is that NDVI is only a rough proxy for absorbed light in the photosynthetically active rate, uh, spectral range. It's a so-called greenness index, even though that's also kind of a misnomer because there's actually no green band being used to determine this. 
So it's a simple band ratio approach that basically gives you an indication whether there's vegetation in the in X or not. Um, and often also how healthy it is because the reflectance in the near infrared is pretty representative of the status as well. So it might not always perfectly represent the total absorbed light by the chlorophyll only, um, as it includes everything like branches and things like this as well. And it gives us no indication as to how efficiently light is being used for photosynthesis. So it doesn't sense the total light that's being absorbed by chlorophyll. And you will need to have some other ancillary estimates for the light use efficiency to basically convert something like an NDVI into a GPP product. Okay, question eight. Can we say that during daytime, we cannot measure SIF, but it, though it is correlated with PS2 yield, and at time as the sun, I'm not sure I understand. And at the time, as the sun is out, we can measure SIF clearly, but it will not be correlated with PS2 yield. Yeah, my, my apologies if this was um, misunderstood the way I phrased it. Um, so we, strictly speaking, we can only measure SIF if the sun is out, because that's basically part of the name of solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence. So the sun has to be the light source to be able to measure SIF. So what you're doing with PAM is you're not measuring SIF because you have an artificial light source. So we measure it only if there's a light source out there, in our specific case, the sun. Um, at very low light, you're right, the PS2 and the fluorescence yields may be anti-correlated, um, but during midday, they, uh, they are correlated again. So using the techniques that we outlined in the talk, we can actually separate the sunlight uh, from the fluorescence signals and thus measure SIP directly, even in sunlight. Basically, we just block off the sunlight a little bit in these so-called frown of lights. Not perfect, but using these techniques, we can separate out the contributions from kind of your light bulb, the fluorescence at the bottom, and the reflected sunlight. All right, question number nine. Please recommend a remote sensing book that contains today's material. I feel, there, feel there's a lot to catch up with. Thanks, yes, I hope this was not too much of a buffer overflow today. Um, so for that reason, I refer to some of the overview papers at the end of the talk that might be a little bit easier to digest. So feel free to take a look at those again on slides. The order there might be the other way around. Um, we can also try to post the links to these papers directly um, on here. Some of them should be public access, um, open to everyone. Um, some, not all of them might, but there's not yet a really good book on that. Um, but we can also try to find, for instance, one thing that would might actually be quite helpful is, for instance, Philip's PhD thesis. There's probably a lot of material in there um, that people typically don't access because it's kind of gray literature. Um, but we can post a link maybe somewhere here. Is that right, Philip? Yeah, um, maybe also your book or the chapter of the book you've wrote with Joe Barry. Yes, this this is a linked on the on the slide as well. This okay. Is, uh, yeah. Great, that would be fantastic. All right, question ten: Would the retrieval of SIF, especially in the far red, be difficult from aquatic systems because it would be absorbed by water? Excellent question. Um, Maybe I glanced over this part, but in fact, we have not yet managed to measure fluorescence in the far red for this exact reason. And the fact that the first fluorescence peak at 680 nanometer is typically higher if you look at it at the chloroplast level. It's only in a leaf uh, where you have so much chlorophyll reabsorption that suddenly the secondary peak at 740 nanometers appears to be stronger than the first. But for phytoplankton in the ocean, typically the first peak is stronger in the first place. And then the second peak around 700, 400, 740 nanometers is also being reabsorbed by liquid water absorptions in the ocean. So that's being subdued in that sense. So what we've shown you for fluorescence over the oceans is actually all measured in the red spectral range, not in the far red spectral range. Good question. Great, great. All right, question 11. Can SIF be used to monitor habitat restoration? Um, in principle, yes, but um, I, I should honestly state that for some tasks, it might really be overkill. So there's things that, that SIF might be ideally suited for, 
but for things like habitat restoration or in general if you want to track like the greenness of your backyard simple vegetation indices might actually be better in that case as it provides kind of a better spatial resolution and you can absorb changes in habitats fairly well um, so with fluorescence we are still working at the kilometers resolution at the moment um, whereas with uh, images you can go to like 30 meters resolution on landsat resolution things like this which might be much better to really detect kind of finely grained changes in habitat restorations. It depends a little bit on the purpose. I mean, if you're interested in tracking like a 50 by 50 kilometer area, then yes, fluorescence might be a reasonable choice to look at as well. But if you want to uh, detect changes at the sub-kilometer level, a MODIS, Landsat and the like will be much better suited. Great. Question 12, Dan, this is related to uh, question uh, two questions ago what about having an idea over phytoplankton species distribution and density via these measurements uh, that's a good question we haven't what we do right now is we only measure the fluorescent signal um, we have no idea yet what kind of phytoplankton species this is whether it's kind of um, that's hard the photo system itself should be the same for both so the mechanism as to how fluorescence is being generated in the process should not really matter in that case um we might probably need some ocean color additional information to actually get some information about the phytoplankton species distribution but that's a good question but it's a little bit out of uh, our comfort zone because we we just started kind of working on the ocean and this is an area that we are trying to explore ourselves but we are just in the uh, initial steps because we are so focused on land at the moment. Okay. Well, so you you, oh, you could say that uh, maybe the spectral shape itself could could give us some insights in this respect, but on the other hand, um, you have so the spectral shape will also sh change uh, depending on the depth where the uh, where all those phytoplanktons are. So it's a really hard task to to do that, at least with our tools right now. Okay, question 13. Are there other spaceborne sensors used to measure SIF? And this is something that Karen Ewan will cover on Thursday, but uh, maybe you can uh, discuss, discuss this a little bit here, Karen? Yeah, just the quick answer all the sensors that can do this are listed on this climate sciences.jpl.nasa.gov slash sif website um so there are some mentioned already here like gosat oco2 oco3 tropomi gomi gomi2 i should stress though that none of these missions have been designed to actually uh work on sif all of these are air quality missions that have been designed to measure trace gases in the atmosphere uh, we kind of take them and abuse them to measure fluorescence the only dedicated mission that will fluorescence will have fluorescence as its real target mission target will be the fluorescence explorer mission flex from the european space agencies but this is not yet flying great so christian when is flex intended to fly uh good question I, I i don't want to give an answer right now because i i don't really know i would have to look it up what, what i think it's scheduled for 2024 yeah okay all right great so uh question 14 can you summarize some applications for sif <laughs> good question um i should have read that that question earlier that so that i can prepare well um the first application that we basically had was finding that fluorescence is an excellent proxy for gpp um much much better than we expected so to some degree this linear near linear behavior at coarse or spatial and temporal scales is kind of a, a, an excellent framework with which that we can use to basically estimate give estimates of gpp across the globe using fluorescence measurements especially for air areas like evergreen forests um this actually turned out to be a much much better proxy than anything else that we have at the moment 
So this is definitely one application where we have a better proxy for GBP, despite some of the caveats that I mentioned before. Um, at the same time, so our big other hope is that we can also detect stress a little bit earlier than some of the other vegetation measurements, because in principle, we should have some signal of the fluorescence yield in, uh, in the PS2 yield through fluorescence as well. So in principle, fluorescence should go down a little bit under stress even if the leaf itself doesn't really change its pigment, its pigments. That would be uh, one other application for fluorescence from space. This is sometimes still a little bit hard to detect directly because we have to average in time and space as well over more like an eight day period. And then quite often even leaf pigments change. So these are some of the, um, the other part is there's many, many regions on the globe where MODIS or other images might sometimes not have great coverage because there's, for instance, in the Amazon, there's frequent cloud cover. So fluorescence might actually give us an insight through clouds as well, which is also highly important because quite often we don't actually know exactly how much photosynthetic active radiation is reaching a canopy under cloudy conditions. So in that way, fluorescence might be a more unbiased proxy for true APAR even under cloudy conditions and not just clear sky conditions. We can try to summarize more later, but off the cuff, this was what kind of came up in my mind. Maybe to add on top of the GPP, uh, it's from a broader perspective, it's also just to, to look at the seasonal cycle of photosynthesis in the first place, especially for evergreen needle leaf forests, which always look the same, but they might not be active or they might already be active. And that's what we see earlier with fluorescence than with other um, vegetation indices, which might be also affected by snow coverage, uh, where we don't have as many problems. Okay, question number 15. Has anyone looked at measuring SIF from aircraft or UAVs for high resolution measurements? Excellent question as well. Um, there's different kind of measurements, um, some from uh, the group in Jülich in Germany from the so-called high plan sensor. And then at JPL, we have also developed our own imaging system for aircraft, uh, the chlorophyll fluorescence imaging spectrometer, or high plan is H H Y P and then, then plant like P-L-A-N-T. Um, from UAVs in principle, if you put like a medium resolution spectrometer on there and fly near above the canopy, you should also be able to do this from UAV systems. It's just that quite often you need stability in the detector. And if you have a small UAV, this is currently still relatively hard, but there are some measurements from a group in Spain that actually uses UAVs to measure fluorescence and vegetation indices as well. All right, question number 16. How do you know NPQ is equal to zero for stressed ve ve uh, vegetation? Oh, um, maybe this was also, NPQ is not zero for stressed vegetation. Um, when NPQ is, NPQ equals zero if a leaf is dark adapted. So you can think of it, um, if you take a leaf, even if it has been outside in the sun and put it into like a dark chamber so that it doesn't see any light, slowly but steadily, all these non-photochemical quenching mechanisms will relax and go down to zero. This is the reason why in these PAM measurements that I mentioned that you basically look first at a dark condition of a leaf and then you put it into light because that's the only way to do, perform some measurements where KN is at its lowest. If it's not sustained on photochemical quenching. So there's a difference in evergreen overwinter, overwintering plant, uh, plants. There might still be NPQ going on at night, it might not go to zero because it's sustained long-term quenching. But the dynamic one typically is going down to zero. So the KN goes zero in dark conditions, but it might take 15, half, 15 minutes, half an hour, up to an hour to fully relax and reduce the NPQ to its minimum. I like to view it as so NPQ or fluorescence as the fastest mechanism to dissipate energy. 
And NPQ has basically two different regimes. One is on a daily level and one is on a seasonal level. So that might help to um, yeah, just to digest that a bit. All right, question number 17. What does the plant re-emit, why does the plant re-emit parts of the absorbed light by fluorescence? The simple answer is probably it can't help it. <laughs> it's an intrinsic property. It's basically the lifetime of the excited state of chlorophyll fluorescence, uh, of a chlorophyll mole molecule. So it's basically a natural process that would happen with chlorophyll anyhow, even if the plant is not <laughs> embedded around it, if you have a pure chlorophyll solution. Um, the thing that plants do, they have other mechanisms to quench the excited state of chlorophyll even faster than fluorescence. So this is happening through photosynthesis or non-photochemical quenching, but in principle, the plants can't just do anything about it because it just happens with a chlorophyll molecule. At the same time, it doesn't really hurt. It's only a small fraction, around 1% of the energy that's getting lost that way, which is, at the end of the day, nearly nothing. So it's not kind of a huge energy loss term for the plants, but it is something that the plants can't control. Okay, question number 18. Can you comment on large-scale SIF, uh, how it's closely related to APAR, to GPPM? Okay, so I assume that the question is meant, um, let's say we take a measurement over like an entire hemisphere. Let's take an extreme example. Um, you take a sensor that measures fluorescence and let's say measures a whole continent, let's say North America or South America. And you, you basically integrate the signal over a long time period over an entire continent. So all you would measure is basically the integrated fluorescence signal, fluorescence emission over that entire continent. And that's an unbiased product. So in principle, this signal that you would measure if you had like a really bad spectrometer with the, the spatial resolution of a continent would measure exactly the same integrated signal if compared to like the perfect instrument that can measure at 30 meter resolution and then you just add all the subpixels up so it would give you exactly the same value theoretically which is very different from like an imaging system imagine measuring the ndvi of an entire continent it would be meaningless it would not be the same as measuring the NDVI at 30 meters and then averaging everything together, if that makes sense. So it's kind of an unbiased estimator that's irrespective of scale for APAR. Because we are basically blind to snow, we are blind to streets, we are blind to everything else. So all these things that are not emitting fluorescence are blind to us. They don't disturb us. Streetlights right. might. Great. Question 19. Do you think SIF products could replace existing FA PAR products? I'd be careful with the word replacing. I think every product has its place. Um, a lot of the FA PAR products are just provided at such tremendous spatial resolution that they will always be useful. And just by the nature of the fluorescence measurement, we would not be able to get it in the same kind of noise freeness, so to say, and spatial resolution as the imaging spectrometers do, where you just look at the color. So I would not say replace, I would say complement. So they both have, ideally we use kind of combinations of products to try to tease out changes in, let's say, light use efficiencies from changes that are purely related to FA power. So kind of a combined analysis of satellite data that looks into FA power or even looks into proxies for non-photochemical quenching like the photochemical reflectance index. If you could start combining data, you get much more information out of it. But it will certainly not replace high resolution measurements from MODIS, Landsat, or other satellites. Great point. Okay, question 20. How much of the correlation between core SIF GPP is about the APAR variation versus the changing yield ratios? Is the dynamic range of the yield ratio particularly large? That is an excellent question. Um, that, to be honest, is still a little bit hard to answer for various reasons. Um, 
once we look at cost shift to GDP, we often don't really have a good or let's say perfect proxy for APAR. People try to use something for APAR, but then you divide both SIF and GPP by some number that might be wrong, and then it's correlated with each other, but it doesn't mean anything because you're using the wrong APAR um, and the common APAR. So in that sense, it's still very tricky sometimes to disentangle these effects. You might even changing leaf orientations might change APAR, and then you might confuse it with yield changes. There's lots of things that might disturb both the signals. So the only thing where we could really tackle this is at the leaf scale, when you basically stress a leaf um, at the same light conditions without actually changing um, the absorption in there. Then there's other effects that are actually even, even more insidious. Um, you might have chloroplast movements within the leaf itself. So they are stacking on top of each other to minimize light absorption under stress conditions and high blue light sometimes. Or you might leaves have leaves wilting, changing their shape a little bit, or moving away from the sun. So plants can actually, there's two different ways to cope with stress. One is of course to turn on non-photochemical quenching, but an even easier method for plants is to try to avoid light absorption in the first place. And some can do that by actively changing leaf positions or basically wilting in that sense, but that's the wrong word here. Um, but basically trying to minimize the absorption even in the cellular at the cellular level by stacking the chloroplast against the cell wall. There's tricky things that are happening. So that, that makes it often a little bit hard to really disentangle them directly. But overall, APA has a much higher dynamic range. And the fluorescence to GPP changes due to yields for fluorescence are probably on the order of plus minus 20% whereas APA can spend orders of magnitude. If that okay. helpful. Question 21. Sorry, did you have anything else that you um, wanted to? I think, yeah, that's good. Great. Question 21. Is SIF more linked to FAPAR or uh, to LUE, light use efficient? I would say SIF is more linked to APA. So that's the absolute value of SIF is always closely linked to FA par times par. In many conditions on the global scale, there's a complication that we don't really know what par is above the canopy directly. So that's already a good thing. So SIF captures this uncertainty to a degree as well. And the F in, FA, uh, in, in the fraction of absorbed light, it captures also well because we are only sensitive to the fraction that has really been absorbed by the antenna system of the plant. So that is a fundamental difference to vegetation indices. So to first order, most of the drivers globally are related to changes in APA across the globe. The light use efficiency part is always a second order effect that might modulate uh, the yields and fluorescence on the order of plus minus 20 percent, roughly. But at the same time, again, if you look at the canopy, there are not every leaf is the same. So leaves at the top of the canopy might actually experience much more light stress, so to say, than leaves that are in heated conditions. So this mixture there is, is, is one that we have to deal with as well, because stress is not evenly distributed across the canopy in the vertical domain. Okay, question 22. Is your fluorometer experiment, or in the fluorometer experiment, why is Kp equal to zero when there is no light at the beginning in the dark stage? I mean Kp max at the beginning dark stage. Oh, okay, so he's meaning Kp max. Oh, it's, it's max. It basically means that if it's dark, no, um, no photosystem is closed. So that the theoretically maximum rate of Kp is, is highest. So you basically have every little light that you put in there, which is basically this modulating light beam, can be quenched through Kp directly. So no photosystem has been closed at that time. That means you have a maximum um, Kp yield at that time. Whereas if you give it that, that, that flash, which is, in terms of PAR units, probably around like 8,000 micromole per square meter per second, 
it's so bright that the plants can't really quench the energy fast enough. So that basically forces the photocenters to close. So no light can be funneled through that anymore. And that's how you set KP to zero once you flash it with a saturating light beam. But try flying something like this on a spaceborne satellite. That's not going to work. Okay, hey, question 23. Is it possible to differentiate between healthy vegetation and ill vegetation or disease vegetation with SIF data? Yes, typically we see that uh, under normal conditions, healthy vegetation is emitting a lot more fluorescence than unhealthy vegetation. Quite often, they would also show quite a difference in their vegetation indices. Um, but at the same time, we also see that, let's say, a forest system that might have an FA power of one or near one um, is emitting much less fluorescence than a healthy corn canopy, which also has a, like an FA power of around almost close to one. Um, so in that sense, we always see fluorescence over like um, agricultural areas to always be highest across the globe, not only in the US. With Tropomi, we see many more agricultural areas across the globe. The corn belt in the US is just something that, that really glows up in the summertime and has the highest peak fluorescence values across the globe. So in that, that sense, it really reflects the intense uh, productivity of corn, like any agricultural area, which are typically very healthy because they've been designed to be that way. Great. So question 24, there are multiple parts to this question. The first part on the SIF data, can we use SIF data in a GIS software? That's been answered above. But then there's uh, the other parts. How does SIF differ from NDVI? What's the SIF accuracy in percent? And can we detect water stress? Okay. Um, so how does it differ from NDVI? Um, it's mostly kind of the spatial resolution um, that in NDVI is just much different what we can't really do um, at the fine spatial scales. Um, but I think the the difference to NDVI kind of, we answered a little bit beforehand already so that NDVI in principle captures only kind of a band ratio approach, kind of the greenness of the plant. It's basically a ratio in the far red around this 850 nanometer range and in the spe uh, red spectral range. Um, so I don't know whether this appropriately answered this question. SIF accuracy in percent. Yes. Maybe mention here that uh, so NDVI or greenness in general is rather referring to capacity, while fluorescence is more activity. Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. So NDVI might give you a, a theoretical upper limit of what a canopy can do. What it actually does might not always be fully captured. SIF accuracy in percent. Um, I want to stress that we have to distinguish precision and accuracy. So I would say SIF is typically very accurate, but, but imprecise. So a single measurement of fluorescence can have errors of 50% easily. Um, related to its kind of absolute value. If you measure fluorescence over a non-vegetated area, then the, the SIF precision and percent of the background signal is basically in infinity um, because you divide by zero. So SIF, a single measurement is often noisy um, just because we have to measure it in the way that, that we outlined before. That's why we have to average data in space and time to actually look at the cause of spatial and temporal averages. Um, but it is important to keep the precision in mind and what we always do for each and every individual point that you will get from us from space, we will give you the fluorescence value and we will give you an estimate of the one sigma precision error in there, which is the purely noise related one, which basically translates how noise on the detector, similar to your digital camera, translates into noise in our retrieved properties. So this is something that we comp compute during the retrieval process from first principles. So it's a very accurate measurement, accurate error estimate. And once you start to 
aggregate or average soundings over one area, you basically scale your uncertainty by the square root of the number of observations. So let's yeah. say you have uh, nine observations and you decrease your uncertainty by a third. Yeah, that's a very good point that Philip made. So in our case, all the precision errors are perfectly uncorrelated. That means that we can basically use proper error propagation and then typically you reduce your error in the mean by, uh, the, the, you basically have to divide it by the square root of n, square root of the number of measurements that you averaged over. All right, so we're coming up at the top of the hour. How about uh, two more questions and then we'll close this off. Uh, next question, which case on a sunny day versus a cloudy day shows a better relationship between GPP and SIP? Good question. Um, <laughs> I, typically, I would say on a cloudy day, if you have a lower dynamic range of the total sunlight that hits the canopy, fluorescence and GPP should be somewhat more linearly related because you have not reached yet the light levels where GPP levels off. So you basically reach kind of the light saturation point of photosynthesis, but you will be more in the linear range where GPP and fluorescence are almost perfectly correlated. So under fully bright sunny skies, there we often see both in measurements and theoretically a slight non-linearity between fluorescence and GPP. Because at very high light, a GPP might be, the PS2 yield is fractionally more reduced than the fluorescence yield. All right, and then one more question. Question 26, is it possible to combine SIF with other remote sensing data, such as, for example, Landsat, and can it be used to monitor multi-temporal above-ground biomass changes or modeling? Um, to the first part of the question, yes, it's absolutely possible to combine SIF with other remote sensing data. Um, Landsat is, of course, very high resolution, so there might be more of a discrepancy because you will have to aggregate lots of Landsat data to represent the fluorescence footprint. MODIS might be better suited in terms of spatial resolution. So you have like a 500 or 250 uh, meter resolution and there's lots of studies that combine fluorescence. And for instance, MODIS data to downsample the fluorescence products from its core spatial scales to finer spatial scales. Alex Turner has done wonderful work in the US or for California. Um, can it be used to monitor multi-temporal above-ground biomass changes? Um, yes, in principle, if above-ground biomass changes change kind of APA in that sense, or some of the other efficiencies, we should be able to see changes in there as well. But in some cases, it might be better than to combine it with other measurements. Let's say LIDAR measurements would be probably, multi-temporal LIDAR measurements would be much better to detect changes in the structure than fluorescence would. Um, plus Landsat and MODIS data would also help in that case. So yes, I would say if you can, it's great to combine it with other remote sensing data. Great, so we'll uh, wrap it up here. There are a number of questions we didn't get to, but what we'll do is, as mentioned, we will um, respond these on the document and we will be posting the document. So I want to thank uh, Professor Frankenberg, uh, uh, Philip and, and Karen and all of you for your attendance today. Um, before I close it off, uh, Professor Frankenberg, would you like to say anything? Yeah, this is um, exciting to have more than 500 people in a, in, a, in a study like this. This is probably the biggest audience I've ever spoken to. Um, great to see this interest and curiosity and great questions across the board. So um, keep that up, please, and try to embed fluorescence in your research if you can. We would be very excited about that. Wonderful. I'm sure they will. So uh, tune in to uh, Thursday where uh, Karen and Philip will be talking about uh, the, the different SIF uh, satellites in space and then uh, a demo on how to use
tropomi and OCO2 data. So thank you all very much, and uh, we will uh, connect again on Thursday at the same time. Have a great day. Thank you, day. everyone. Bye. Thanks, Erica. Thank you.